parables are more than just a story. Much more. Approximately 35% of Jesus' recorded sayings are parables. Some scholars call them weapons of warfare. Let us connect with the truths of these parables and experience the blessings and life changes that come from understanding and applying them in our minds and hearts. Parables are more than story. You got your Bibles, please grab them. Get in the habit of bringing them as well so you can mark up your own. You can read along. If you do it digitally, that's just fine. I'm not going to think that you're texting during church. I'm going to assume that you're reading your Bible and not checking Instagram. I'm going to be preaching on a very famous parable today. You know it as the, the prodigal son. Probably one of the most famous of all of Jesus' parables. Christians and non-Christians alike refer to the prodigal son. And, and I believe, though, that it's a, it's a mistitle, again, uh, that we put onto it. Because the word prodigal just simply means wasteful. That's what it means. And, and what we've done is we've made this guy kind of the hero of the story. The bummer is, is that he's not. What we're going to learn today, my hope, is that you see that this is not so much about a, a wasteful prodigal child as much as it is about the heart of God. That's really what this parable should be called, the heart of God. We know how amazing God's heart is. If you've been walking with Jesus for any length of time, you know how sweet he can be. You know how kind and benevolent he is. And, and I know for some people, they don't view God the Father this way. They, they view his, him as some angry, angry being up in heaven, pointing down at us, waiting for people to fail. Uh, that's not the heart of God at all. That's, that's completely a misunderstanding of who God is. Let, let me give you an illustration in my own little simple mind about how kind God is. I, I think of when we raised our three kids. We have a long gravel driveway, right? And my boys were like kamikazes on that driveway and their bikes, and they'd go flying down that driveway. And nine times out of 10, <laughs> there they went, right? Every part of their body that was exposed was now filled with rocks and blood and dirt. What did my kids do? They didn't run to their dad. I would have done what Frank said, throw some dirt on it, you'll be fine. <laughs> you know what they did? They went to their mom. Do you know why? Because they knew their mom was going to take care of them. They knew their mom was going to pray over their owies. They knew their mom was going to throw some neosporin and a band-aid on there and then send them on their way. Do you know what they didn't ever expect from my wife? A lecture on how to ride a bike. She wasn't going to do that. And they knew that she was kind, and so they would go to her because that's where they were safe to go. God the Father says, I want you to come to me. I'm kind. I know what you need. That's what this entire story is about. But there's this problem. We don't always want to go to God. Sometimes we like to do things on our own. We all have this, uh, this disease, if you will. It's called hedonism. See, we don't want to go to God because our first, our first go-to would be our own pleasures. We love seeking pleasure. And see, apart from Christ, that's what we do. We seek our own pleasures, and, and we don't view God correctly, knowing that he, we find our pleasure in him right? Not in what the world can offer us. And so this idea that, that the prodigal son was wasteful, well, isn't that every one of us in this room? Shouldn't we all be called prodigal sons and daughters? Have you not squandered at times what God has given to you? Have you not taken advantage of what God has done for you? So what I want us to do is I want us to refocus a bit, and I want to answer a simple question. What is God's heart for this? For whatever you're going through, whatever season of life you find yourself in, I want us to answer, really, what is God's heart? And the, the short answer, not to skip the entire sermon, but God's heart is that we would run to him. He, that we would run to him, not from him. He wants us to come to him. That's the heart of God. So let's, let's dive into the word of God today. We'll be in Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11. And, and we're only reading up until 24. Read with me, would you? And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. He divided the property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had, and he took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, 
who sent him into his field to feed pigs. And, and he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose, and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, and he felt compassion. And he ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf, and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son, he was dead, and he is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Jesus Christ, I thank you for this parable that you told. I thank you that we have it recorded so we can now learn from you, Jesus. I ask that you would do what only you could do. You would take this message through the power of your Holy Spirit, and you would open our spiritual eyes to see what you would have us to see, our spiritual ears to hear what you would have us to hear, and then we would go do something with it. So meet us here this morning, God, and, and, and show us what it is that you have for us, and especially, God, show us what your heart really is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so Jesus is talking to all these Pharisees. He's talking to his disciples. And he said to them, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that's coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Okay. So we've got some back-to-back -back stories happening in chapter 15. If you look, you've got three parables all about something being lost and something being found, whether it's a coin or, or, or a boy like this, right? So he's showing his disciples, he's showing us today what it means to be lost and then to be found. A couple of quick facts when we look at this text is, is that according to Jewish law, an older son always received twice as much as the younger sons, okay? So a couple of quick facts though. Back in the day, the oldest son always got twice as much as everybody else, especially the youngest son. It's just how it was. It wasn't bad, but guess what? The youngest son's not even asking for his brother's inheritance. He's just asking for his own. Okay, and so you've got that going on, and actually it was legal. The dad could distribute his wealth at any point he so desired. He didn't have to die for it to be distributed. And one other fascinating fact is, is it, you could, even as the youngest son, ask for your inheritance before dad died. That was, that was acceptable. You know what the problem was? When a child asked his dad for his inheritance before he was dead, he's basically saying, I'm done with you. I want your money. I don't want you. So he's in essence saying, peace out. I've got no use for you. So by asking this, it's a very, very big deal. I can only imagine what that would have been like for the father. And this is a parable. I understand that. But this is a parable of what actually transpired in that day. And he was giving us a story about it. Thinking about what this dad have, has gone through, I was praying for you guys this week, and, and I know a number of you have brokenness in your families. A number of you have, have, have had this rejection, this rebellion in your own homes. And you know what that feels like. And you also know what it's like to hope that that child will come back. You know what that's like. And I think it's just fine to be extremely disappointed in the decisions that our kids make. As parents, it can be quite difficult when, when they make choices that you don't agree with, when they make choices that go against how you raise them. It's very hard to go through. But see, God's given us this, this thing called free will, right? It's our, our, our ability to choose sin or, or to not choose sin. And when our kids choose sin, that's their choice. When we choose sin, that is our choice, right? And when we chase hedonistic pleasures, when we do like this son wants to do and go chase after what makes us feel good, that is, yes, our choice, but it comes with massive consequences. And, and, and I'll tell you right now, you know that you're heading for trouble. Just think about your own lives when you, when you prioritize pleasure over purity, when you prioritize money over ministry, when you prioritize profits over people, you're headed for danger because it just shows your selfishness on display. And, and when we're headed down the wrong path, the Holy Spirit's like, wait, stop. He gives us these warnings. It's called convictions. And you know that they're there. We oftentimes just choose to deny them. 
So what we got to do is, even if we're going down the wrong path, just pause for a nanosecond and say, God, what is your heart for this? What, what do you want me to do? And he's going to tell us, I, you just need to lean into Jesus in your despair. This is where we start. Like for the Father, just lean into Jesus. For you, with a brokenness in your home, you just need to lean into Jesus. When you've got things not going the right way, you literally need to lean into Jesus. Just like a father would be expected to as a Christ follower when his family goes sideways. We live in a very broken culture, and there's a lot of sadness that a lot of us have experienced. And we need to remember this term, just lean into Jesus. Just lean in to Jesus. And, and so we don't run from Jesus, we run to him, which is how we're leaning into him. Track with me? Okay, so let's keep going here. Jesus continues on with the story. and He says, not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. There he squandered his property in reckless living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to, to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the, his fields and to feed his pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. So the dad divided up the property. Maybe he had to do like, nowadays it would be like a lot line adjustment, Right? I'll sell off that parcel of land. Maybe he had liquid assets, and all he had to do was cut a check to the sun. All we know is that it took about a few days, and somehow this money materialized, and, and the sun turned it all into cash. The sun had a plan. He was going to go party hardy. Could you imagine the dad watching his son, packing his bags, saying, I'm done with you. I got no use for you. Thanks, Dad. I'm out. That's what the picture that Jesus is giving us here today. How many of you have done this? Oh, okay, so maybe you didn't squander your living father's inheritance. Maybe, maybe you didn't tell your parents, I'm done with you. But how many of you told God you're done with him? How many of you said, I don't like how I was raised? I'm out. How many of you have been so hurt that you blamed it on God? How many of you have just been so tired that you just don't want to go on anymore? When we, like the youngest son, we say that to God, we're telling him, not good enough. What you have given to me is not good enough. That's what the son is saying. And, and I, 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 we, we demonize him, right? This is an easy one to do because he's kind of asking for it. Right? But in our own lives, we are not too far-fetched from telling God, not good enough. I don't like my body. I don't like my car. I don't like my standard of living. I don't like the spouse you gave me. I don't like the kids you gave me. All day long, we could do this. We're telling God, not good enough. It's not the heart of a Christ follower. We find gratitude and gratefulness for everything that Christ has given to us. So the youngest said, he, he, he didn't just bail he basically says, I'm done with you. He squandered his property in reckless living. He says, I'm done with you. He goes to a distant country so nobody can check on him, and he gets isolated, and he blew it all. Oh, probably on sex, drugs, and rock and roll. He spent every dime that he had, and I don't know how much it was. We don't know. But if you want to just do easy numbers, let's say the dad's estate was worth a million bucks. Oldest son gets 670. Youngest son gets 330. He blew $330,000 just like that. You think, how can he do that? Well, we'll learn in, in, a, in a following sermon, it would have been with prostitutes, and it would have been with reckless, sinful, chasing living. There is a recipe for disaster waiting for us when we chase pleasure, and we chase the wrong things. The wake of destruction in our life goes really wide when we are no longer chasing God, but we're chasing pleasure, which was his choice. Here's the problem, though. When, when you dive deep into the pool of selfish living, you dive deep into the pool of sin, it only lasts for so long. So either those sins are no longer good enough, so you want to do even bigger sins, because sin doesn't have a stop sign. You agree with me? Sin never has a stop sign. So we just keep on going. So that, that could happen. Or we could be like the, the, the youngest son here and run out of money. So the party's over. He's broke. So now what do we do? And he had spent everything, a severe famine then arose in that country. And he began to be in need. He's no longer living high on the hog. God's timing is transitioning his life. Have you ever had this in your own life? Where God's timing, all of a sudden you're just forced to make a decision? Well, here he is. He's got no money left. He's starving. And he, he doesn't know what else to do. So he's empty and he's broke. The famine affected everybody around him. 
Because of his hedonistic pursuits, he was stuck right there. So he went and he hired himself out. He's like, I got an idea. I got one ballot option. I'm going to hire myself out to one of the citizens of the country who then sent him into the field to feed pigs. He was a laborer. He basically was like a servant like his dad had. He was, he was basically just working out in the fields. And it's plagued with irony that, he, that Jesus would use the word pigs because the Jews would never have anything to do with pigs. They were unclean, right? So it's this idea that now he's almost viewed as a, as a pagan, as a sinner, as one that's out because he's now hanging out with pigs. Jesus used this, this, this animal on purpose. One of the craziest things that I know about God, though, even if he uses a word like pigs, even if the timing is a famine, all of these things, I know that Jesus meets us right there. Look back on your life in your times of despair. Just take a moment. Think of something in the last year that's caused your heart to be heavy. Can you remember Jesus meeting you right there in that moment? That's what he does. This is what he does. God's heart is that we would lean into Jesus in our despair, and that God's heart is that he would meet us in our brokenness. He doesn't leave us there. He's not some big guy in the sky saying, I knew you were going to do that. Shame on you. He meets us in our brokenness. He meets us in that moment when we desperately need him, when we've abandoned him, when we've turned our back on him, when we said, not good enough. He meets us in that moment. I'm not sure where you're at today, but, but maybe you're kind of where the youngest son found himself, broken and empty, trying like heck to fill that void trying to make it make sense, and it just doesn't seem to make sense. He's starving, right? He's longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. They're these little pea pods that fall off of trees. They were kind of sweet, so the pigs loved to eat them. That's what he was eating. That's what he was eating. Uh, translation nowadays, it's called rock bottom. He's at the bottom of the barrel. He's now eating what the swine are eating. Broken, empty. Don't miss this last little part. And no one gave him anything. Completely alone. Don't forget that when he told his dad, peace out, he burnt that bridge, hypothetically speaking. So he has nowhere to go. He's got no valid options. And this is where Jesus meets us. Amen? When we have no options, he's like, I am right here for you. This is all part of God's work. Oftentimes, when we're walking in disobedience, we, God will go to great lengths to get our attention. When we're walking in disobedience, he's like, I need you back over here. So I'm going to do a number of things to get your attention. So pay attention. So pay attention to what God is doing in your life. Maybe you've experienced this recently where you're having a bad day. Bad text came in, bad news from the boss, another family member didn't do this right or whatever. And you have that moment of despair, you have that moment of confusion, you have that moment of pain, and then my hope is that Jesus met you in that moment. He, he met you right there, and, and you're drawn back to God, no longer to run away from him, but to run towards him. That's the Holy Spirit working inside of you, drawing us back to the loving arms of the Father. So the youngest son now finds himself at a place where there's no one to help him. Nobody's there for him, and he's got no valid options. And so when he came to himself, right, light bulb moment goes on. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish with hunger? I'll arise. He's got an idea. I'm going to get up, go to my dad, and I'm going to say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. His brokenness brought him to his senses. Oh, okay, you could say because he's broke, he's hungry. But that doesn't mean he gets the light bulb moment. Holy Spirit's moving in this guy's heart, and he knows the logical thing, the best thing to do is to go back to dad. My guess is he realized that his life had become hopeless and helpless and pretty much pointless. And then he has this recollection of what it was like back at dad's house. See, to be truly filled, which is what he was trying to fill with everything wrong, to be truly filled is to be sitting at the table of God. To be truly filled is to, to hunger and to eat the word of God and to allow his Holy Spirit to make it make sense in our heart. That's when you start to get filled up 
everything else is just going to dissipate. Everything else won't last. So I want to ask you a simple question. What are you hungry for today? Oh, the good Christian answer is the Word of God. And it's true. My hope is that that hunger in you is just burning. And you can't get enough of the Bible. You can't get enough of understanding who God is and what He's done and who He's calling you to be. And you just dive back into the Word. But maybe, you're, if you're honest, you're really hungry for sex. Maybe, if you're honest, you're really hungry for pleasure. Maybe, if you're honest, uh, you want to you wanna do some drugs. You want to drink too much alcohol to, to numb the pain. And so you don't have to deal with the real of what's going on. Or, or you just stay busy. You just throw yourself into your work so you don't got to think no more. Maybe you isolate so that you don't have to, to cope with reality. And maybe you're like the youngest who said, forget it, I'm diving into sin, and I'm going to do whatever I want to do. All of those things, minus the word of God, all of those things will leave you empty, broken, and hopeless. We're not intended to be filled with these things. We're supposed to be intended. We are intended by God to be filled by his Holy Spirit and through his word. So the youngest son, though, he's not ready for this yet, right? He's just had a thought. He's just thinking through, what should I do? And he has this thought, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? And yet I perish here with hunger. Here he is, a hired servant, eating pea pods, while his father's servants are getting luscious bread and good meals. He has a plan. He's like, you know what? I'll arise, I'll go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and I've sinned before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So treat me as one of your hired servants. I, I, have you ever done this? When I was in business, I always did this. I played through the entire scenario before I went to a meeting. Am I the only one that's done that? You play through the conversation, right? You kind of play it out in your head, how this could turn out. What should I say? What shouldn't I say? How should I say it? Body language, all that stuff. That's what we're getting right here. He's having this moment where he's thinking through the scenario. He's got an idea, and he's like, I think it just might work, even though I burnt that bridge. He remembered the heart of his dad. It wasn't necessarily just his hunger that drove him there. He remembered the heart of his father. Just like my kids would run to my, my wife when they got hurt. They would always remember they're not going to get scolded. They're going to get loved. Is there a rebuke that comes? Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a consequence to our sins. Every action has a reaction. So you go chase sin and oh yeah, you're going to have all kinds of things to deal with. But you know what you don't have to deal with? An angry God who's against you. He's a loving father who says, just come home. Come back to me. That is his heart. I don't ever want us to forget one of God's greatest things about his heart is that God's kindness is waiting for us. The son knew that his father was kind. I don't know how you view God the Father today, but I'm going to tell you right now that he's very good. God the Father is very kind. And God's kindness actually has a purpose besides just being so nice. Romans 2, 4, he says, Paul says, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. God's kindness should move in you in such a way where you're like, I hate my sin. I don't want nothing to do with my sin. God's kindness it, it, it creates in us this desire to just be freed of it, knowing the only way that we can be freed of our sin is through his kindness and his forgiveness. The youngest son was about to experience this kindness that many of us have experienced. Again, it was not the emptiness that brought him to this sense. It was the memory of his loving God. So if you're chasing a road that you shouldn't be chasing, if you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing, I, I want you to stop for a moment and remember the kindness of God. I want you to remember how good he really is. We can always go back to Jesus. You know what I don't want to miss in this story? This, this thinking process that he's having? He's beginning to repent. He's beginning to change his mind. Holy Spirit's working, right? That's a good thing. The, the, the repentance is a desire given him by God. And so he's going to, you know what he's going to do? He, he, he gets up. He comes to his father. He arose. He did what he said he was going to do. And, and he's a long ways off. And his father saw him. And his father felt compassion. And he ran toward him. He embraced him. He kissed him. 
hey, the guy did what he said he was going to do. He made the plan and he stuck to it. This is a really good plan too. This is a really good, you know what this is? This is a picture of us with God. Don't miss that this is a picture of us with God. God's eye is always on you in a good way. He's always got his eye. He's watching for you to come back. When we return to God, he doesn't sit there and, and say to us, I told you so. You knew how that was going to turn out. No, God's like, oh, God, God, come. I love the picture of God running towards us. God is there to mend our broken hearts. That's a good father. This is what he does. This is what he still does. And this is what he's going to do. He can't help but be kind. He can't help but share and shed his love. The compassion that, that is talked about, it's this idea where in our bowels, it literally comes out. You can't, the father couldn't help but love his son. God can't help but love you. He, he desires to have a relationship with you. He desires to show his kindness to you. He desires to offer his forgiveness to you. God mends our broken hearts. I love the way that Jesus paints this picture. The father is just grateful to have his son home. He's just grateful to have his son home, which is why he ran to him, which is why he gave him a bear hug, which is why he gave his son a kiss. And I, I don't know where you're at right now. If you haven't given your life over to Jesus, maybe you've got a pile of sin that you're just dragging around with you. You know, I've had people tell me before, Pastor, you have no idea what I've done. And I'm like, totally, I don't, you're right. But then I read a story like this, and I'm reminded about a son who basically told his father off, squandered the inheritance. The son who did all of those things is being welcomed back by the father. I know the very people that spit on Jesus Christ and crucified him were offered forgiveness from his very own lips. So I don't know what you've done. I don't know where you're at, but I do know the loving kindness of my father offers you forgiveness today. He desires to hold you. I like the idea that I think, I think the Father is in the business of mending hearts. This is really what he does. He, he mends hearts. He, he makes them whole. It's a time to celebrate for sure, but, but we can't miss what's going on. There's a few things that have happened. So the, the idea that we're trying to unpack is what is God's heart, right? We know we've got to lean into Jesus in our despair, right? We, gotta, we know that God meets us in our brokenness. We, we know that God's kindness is waiting for us. And there's this other piece of we've got to repent. We should be held by God. That's it. It's great. Repent. Run from your sins. It's this idea of, it's a Greek uh, word picture where if we're running this way after sin, we're chasing it. If we truly repent, we turn 180 degrees and we run the other way. And then in the meantime, the Holy Spirit starts changing our mind. All of a sudden, that sin just doesn't taste so luscious anymore. Repent and be held by God. Isaiah 41, 13. The prophet says, for I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. The son squandered his inheritance on sin and reckless living. You know what's more important than that? He repented. We can't miss this part of the story. Yeah, he blew it. How many of us in this room, if we're really honest, have completely blown it? This is the God who says, come to me today. I want to extend my kindness and my forgiveness to you. This, the picture that we're given from Jesus here is that God is the one making the initiative. God is the one doing the drawing of a sinner back to him. God is the one that is drawing him to himself. God is the one that is drawing you to himself. I know for myself, when I was running in sin and I was chasing the wrong stuff, I knew what it meant to repent. And when I finally repented before God and those that I had sinned against, I felt free for the first time in my life. I felt free because I was repentant and I was held by God. I was embraced by a loving father who says, come to me all who labor and are weary and heavy laden and I will give you my rest. I want us to be overwhelmed with the fact that we can be forgiven. It's a crazy idea. But he made a way where there was no way by putting his own son on that cross so that we could actually receive and achieve forgiveness. I think the youngest son learned a lot of lessons through this story. I believe that a dissatisfied heart leads to a dissatisfied life. 
If there's that discontentment, right, your entire life will be affected by it. But in Jesus, that dissatisfaction goes away. That dissatisfaction becomes satisfaction. And that contentment starts to overtake. And so what Jesus wants us to understand, he continues to paint this picture. And, and the son says to his dad, now picture it. Dad's holding the son, gave him a kiss, holding him, holding him tight. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And, and they began to celebrate. Oh, a party is about to ensue. What a great picture of repentance. I believe that Jesus may dance a jig when we repent. I believe that he loves when we repent. When we get rid of us chasing the devil, when we get rid of us chasing the stuff that we don't want to, we shouldn't be chasing, and we come to him, I believe his heart is so happy with us. But the son's super honest. Don't miss this. He didn't pull any punches. He's like, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I know what I did was wrong, and I need forgiveness. I think we need to start praying like this. Start being just completely honest with God. Don't butter it up. He knows what you've done. Be straight. Seek his forgiveness for that specific sin that you have committed. I don't know if you're like me, but I, I can completely resonate when he says to his dad, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I don't know how many times I've sat before the Lord. I knew better. What was I thinking? I knew I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have thought that. I shouldn't have done that. I'm not worthy of your forgiveness and grace yet again. I can picture his head down, his heart heavy, saying, I am not worthy. I don't even think he got the sentence out before the dad interrupted him. The father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. He was probably in the middle of a sentence, and the dad's like, that's enough. I've heard all I need to hear. I can see repentance. Have you, ever, have you ever had this where somebody repents to you and you can physically see their changed heart? I've had this. And all of a sudden, I'm pretty sure this is a picture of our hearts being changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the dad gives orders to his servants, who now his son is no longer one. He says to his servants, go get the goods. It shows that the father now accepted him back as a son. I bet you the dad waited a very long time for this moment. Some of you have waited a long time to watch a loved one return to Christ, to watch one that has sinned against you, rejected you, rebelled against you. I'm sure some of you in this room are still waiting for that moment. Don't stop praying. Do not stop praying. And, and may God give you this moment where you roll out the red carpet. Put a ring on his hand. Spiritually speaking, Jesus is like, you're back. You're mine. Child of God is what we are seeing here. The robe would have been reserved for the best of the best of guests. So the, the, the most elite guests show up and they go get the bougie robe. Go get the robe, go get the ring, go get the shoes. You know what all we're supposed to get from this? He has no needs. The Father is going to take care of everything. It's going to do the same for you. I, I want us to say, like the youngest son, I offer you nothing but my repentance. He didn't even get to pull out the card. Can I just be one of your servants? Like he, he literally is accepted as a repentant son. So why would the father go through all this? Why? 24, for the son of mine was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and now he is found. The dad's got some rejoicing to do. My son has returned. The father heart of God is that we would, we would have this kind of a mindset about God. God just wants us to know the lost would be found. That's his heart. God's heart is that the lost would come to him. Jesus came to seek and save the lost, the sinners. His heart is that they would be found by him. I know, I know this much about Jesus, that he is, he's the only one that can truly heal our hearts. That go all the way back to childhood, brokenness in marriage, rejection by children, Financial matters, health matters. The only healing you're going to get is found in the arms of Jesus. 
I love the idea that it's the love of God, the kindness of God that restores a sinner back to him. I I heard this quote this week, and I just want to share it. The youngest son learned the hard way that you cannot enjoy the things money can buy if you ignore the things money cannot buy. Faith, can't buy it. Can't sell Jesus. What he did was free for us. All he asks is that we give our lives to him. He laid up his life. He paid the price for our sins. It's called atonement. He paid the price for our sins, substituted himself on that cross so that we could receive forgiveness. Lived the sinless life. Took our nasty sins. Us telling him, I don't like what you've given me. Telling him, you didn't do good enough. He took all of that on the cross because he loves us, because he's so kind, because he's so good. It's a picture of Jesus standing there like this saying, come, I'm giving up everything for you. I'm giving up everything for you. Receive my forgiveness. Receive my mercy. The Father heart of God wants us right here. So my prayer is that you would allow, that you would invite the Lord our God to mend your broken hearts. Amen. Jesus Christ, these aren't just preaching words. I ask that through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would mend hearts today. You would take that emptiness, that brokenness, that it just isn't rightness and bring your healing into that matter. And that each of us, God, would experience this today. Not just something we're talking about, but God, something that I know that you can do. You've done it for me. You've done it for a number of us, God. I pray that you would bring that healing and that we would come and sit at your feet. We would ask for your forgiveness. We would repent over our sins and we would believe in you as Lord and Savior. Give us the tenacity to repent. Give us the desire to just be with you and be held by you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.